As we spend the month of August reflecting on paradox and ambiguity, a couple of questions present themselves. What is the truth? And does the truth still matter? Whatever truth is these days, we Unitarian Universalists say we're after it. We're looking for it. We covenant to affirm and promote the right for a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. That's the fourth of the seven Unitarian Universalist principles, and it's no accident that it's smack in the middle of the list. To a religious movement that has, since its inception, been proudly heretical, the right to pursue truth as we see it and where we find it is central. But along the lifespan of our faith movement's history, the parameters by which we measure truth in our society have shifted dramatically. Unitarianism and Universalism arose as separate movements in the colonial states and the later United States in the modernist period. A, uh, uh, it's too general, but a hopeful time running up through the middle of the 20th century during which there were great proclamations about humanity's ability to find its own truth, to shape its own environment, to experiment and find new and better ways of doing things. Away with tradition. Cities were booming, scientific discoveries were taking place all the time, and more were just around the corner. It's easy to see the roots of our liberal faith in this era when even books like the Bible could be publicly questioned as tradition gave way to new learning. One popular example of modernist thinking is the essay Self-Reliance, written by Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was, for a minute, a Unitarian minister. <laughs> he wrote, he was never as great again after he left the Unitarian ministry. <laughs> he wrote, be yourself, no base imitator of another, but your best self. I hope you'll forgive the sexist language in this next line that Emerson wrote. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. And a line I have posted to see when I walk into my office. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Everything old was in question and every dream seemed within reach. As the old liberal hymn proclaimed, for humanity it would be onward and upward forever. Science, which seemed to promise a utopian future, became the judge of truth. But, along with that optimistic view of human nature, came the belief that everything was accessible to everyone. There was something inherently holy and empowering in just being human. No matter who you are, you have in you the tools to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. So if someone or some group of people weren't achieving what the white landowning males who dominated that era thought they should be, there must be some flaw in that person or that group of people. Such is the shadow side of modernism. The benefits of modernization in the U.S. went disproportionately to white people and more generally to people who already had means. The cities that were exploding in population were planned to contain and oppress populations of color, a phenomenon that is well documented now. People began to, think, to be more critical of the onward and upward forever uh, trope. And when the technology that was developed in that optimistic environment was used to slaughter millions of people in the first, in, in, first in the war to end all wars, World War I, and then again when all wars were not ended in World War II, modernism's optimism too was mortally wounded. Now, there's no memo that goes out between modernism and postmodernism that, you know, throw away the modernist books, here's the new set. But sometime between the world wars or maybe a little earlier, postmodernism began its rise. It's a school of thought that grows in the soil of questioning, not so unlike modernism and its willingness to question everything. But postmodernism is more skeptical, less hopeful about the future. Postmodernism questions the idea that all people share one set of core truths or beliefs. Truths, it says, are conditioned by our environments, by our upbringings, by the places we're born and the places we live. It questions whether we can really know everything by science, whether we're really headed onward and upward forever. In fact, that one is pretty much gone, I think. 
questions whether history is making progress even toward a greater future. Maybe, maybe this sounds so natural that we just assume it is so. Postmodernism has certainly become the water that we swim in. In its American embodiment, I think now it is snarky and cynical about institutions. It can tend toward hyper-individualism. Now, postmodern thinking has bred some very cool things. 90s grunge rock, for example. I think it's cool. More importantly, though, it has led to, um, if not new, then uh, inventive forms of literature. One popular example is the children's book series Lemony Snicket and the series of unfortunate events. The series has sold 60 million copies, spawned a movie and a Netflix series, which is really great. Characteristic of postmodernist literature, it blurs the lines between truth and fiction, between the narrator and the characters in the story and the reader of the story. It questions how we know what we know. A few years back, a journalist named Lanika Cruz wrote an article about the series that was entitled Postmodernism for Kids. She described the plot this way. The series chronicled the plight of the three Baudelaire orphans whose lives become a hamster wheel of misery after their parents die in a mysterious fire. She says, it was the book's style, not content, I found most compelling of all. Each installment in the series would begin with some iteration of tortured narrator Lemony Snicket, who she says, I didn't know, was actually author Daniel Handler, urging the reader to put the book down and find some happier way to spend his or her time. <laughs> Snicket would refer to himself extensively, implying that he existed in the same universe as the Baudelaire children. He would repeatedly interrupt the narrative to rant, tell a story, or relay advice that created a splintered reading experience. He would use ponderous terms like in loco parentis, and then he'd spend several sentences defining them. And the endings were, as promised, irredeemably depressing. A narrator who is trying to convince you not to read the book he is narrating what a cool expression of postmodern cynicism. But the journalist Cruz asked a bigger question about the books. Why might postmodern literary techniques resonate with young readers? One explanation, she says, by complicating the relationship between author and reader, between narrator and character, these methods muddy the boundary between text and reality. Young readers might feel the distinction between fact and fiction slipping away lost in the series story within a story within a story. Early in the series run, she said, I found myself believing in the Baudelaire children, or VFD, this sort of shadowy organization, might actually be real, more seriously than I believed my admission letter from Hogwarts on my 11th birthday. <laughs> Such was the intoxicating effect of this imaginary world and the story that seemed to bleed from beyond the pages. Postmodernism is willing to play with the boundaries of reality to try and convince us that we don't know what we think we know. It is virtual reality, and it can be great fun. You can get books in the Lemony Snicket series that have documents that support the story as if you've uncovered. It's fascinating to me. It's, uh, it, it begins to feel more real. But as was the case with modernism, postmodernism has its shadow side. The skepticism with which we view big sweeping narratives like Onward and Upward Forever has been turned on the idea of truth itself. So in some circles, one truth is just as good as another. What's true for you may not be true for me, and what's true today may not be true tomorrow. Science is questioned as a reliable judge of truth, as is the case in some New Age theology, and in climate skepticism. In this mindset, we're both completely free to be ourselves and, I think, less able to make important judgments about what's acceptable in our society. Certainly, this kind of thinking leaves us vulnerable when political actors want to manipulate our thinking. Not that there was ever a time when all American politicians were interested only in the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them die. But some of what's happening lately is alarming. 
In December of last year, if you listen to the podcast Planet Money, you may have heard an episode called Finding the Fake News King. In it, they, they, the uh, journalist writes, a few days before the election, last November's election, An extraordinary story popped up in hundreds of thousands of people's Facebook feeds. The story was salacious, it was vivid, filled with intriguing details. There was a photo of a burning house, a photo of firemen rushing in. The headline read, FBI agent suspected in Hillary email links found dead in apparent murder-suicide. It was all fake. There was no FBI agent, there was no shooting. The site it was published on, the Denver Guardian, isn't a real news source. It was one of many fake news stories that play into conspiracy theories about the Clintons and the journalist and Planet Money says it worked. There's one part of the article that was real, the ads. Someone was making money off this phony news article and dozens of others like it. Someone was making a profit off a fake story that suggested a presidential candidate was a killer. So the journalist at Planet Money tracked down this guy named Justin Kohler, probably not his real name. He started a company called Disinfo Media. But get this, Justin Kohler, he's a registered Democrat. He is a self-confessed liberal. He started out writing satire. He wanted to poke at his own side a little bit with satire. He had this Funny story with the headline, Bernie Sanders combs hair for debate sees polls number soar. (laughs) But then he made the switch to writing fake news. He told the interviewer that he bought up a bunch of fake sites that sounded real, like the Denver Guardian, even usatoday.co. Then he would create a front page full mostly of just regular old news stories. Could be the weather, local football game results, whatever. But on that page, there would be one salacious story, like the Clinton one. And that's the one he would get all the clicks on, so he would sell ads on that article. He did it at first as a prank, a way to poke fun at people who would believe anything. And just consider the cynicism involved even in that. Instead of writing straight news, he's a journalist. And strengthening an institution he saw struggling, he mocked its decline. It didn't hurt that he and his team made millions of dollars peddling fake news as a business. The Clinton story saw 1.6 million hits in 10 days. The shadow side of postmodernism is all over our television screens these days as the president sends people out to lie to the cameras about what's happening right in front of our faces. It's all too reminiscent of 1984. You may know that George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984, was written in 1949, around the beginning of the era of at least U.S. postmodernism. Its warnings are in some ways eerily accurate. The book is set, you may remember, in the fictional country of Oceania. In Oceania, there are four government ministries whose names are intended to sow confusion and to salve the consciences of its citizens. The Ministry of Love enforces loyalty to the government with the use of machine guns and torture. The Ministry of Peace is in charge of the military. It keeps the nation nation rather in a perpetual state of war, using up all the the surplus resources so that citizens are constantly working to keep up, which feeds into the Ministry of Plenty, which rations everything in Oceania. Goods are scarce, but the job of the Ministry of Plenty is to keep people thinking they're living in a land of abundance. And then, in service to all the other ministries, there's the Ministry of Truth. Its job is to falsify history and news whenever it serves the purposes of Oceania's government. The government can never be seen to change its mind. Certainly, it can never look bad in public. So if a party official makes a prediction that turns out to be wrong, the Ministry of Truth, which has power over news outlets and entertainment, just tells a different story. It's not a good sign for democracy when dystopian novels start to feel like reading the newspaper. It's not new, but it sure is prominent. 
postmodernism and our attack on the notion of truth itself has us doubting the news we receive, even when it's accurate, has created a market for stories that reinforce our own leanings, no matter what they are. Cynicism about institutions, places where we meet face to face to do things together, has us vulnerable. What can we do about it? I want to recommend two things. First, I think we have to be brave enough not to be cynical. It takes, I've never been like really cool. It takes so much energy to be cool, I think, and to maintain the cool. And being cynical is so cool, you know, in some circles. I think we have to be brave enough not to go there. It's tempting. It takes courage to stay involved. Heck, it takes courage to open the newspaper some days. But as citizens, especially citizens who are Unitarian Universalists, we need to be vulnerable enough to work hard at maintaining institutions, making them better when they break our hearts instead of abandoning them. September 26th is National Voter Registration Day. I met with the county recorder's office uh, this week, and we at VUU are going to be a part of the celebration of National Voter Registration Day. Here's what we're planning. On September 12th, which is a Tuesday, uh, in the evening, folks from the recorder's office are going to come to VUU and do a training for as many people as want to learn how to get people signed up to vote. Then, after the service on the 24th, just before the National Day of uh, National Voter Registration Day, all of us who receive the training and are willing are going to spend an hour or so knocking on doors in the neighborhood, signing up VUU's neighbors to vote. We're not going to ask them what their political leanings are. I'm not. We'll be working to build participation in the institution of American democracy, which is part of our fifth UU principle, by the way democracy in our communities. In this cynical time, we need to work to rebuild the institutions that comprise, really, our democracy. And second and finally, I think it's important for us to insist on the notion of truth. We can be sophisticated enough to see the difference between religious truth, poetic truth, and the hard facts of science. But let us stay engaged in our democracy. And when we have the opportunity, let us insist on having the facts. Even when the facts shatter progressive illusions, let us, as best we can, fulfill our fourth principle and follow the path toward truth, a path illuminated by science and, yes, facts. They do still exist. We can still find them. And love, with a healthy dose of skepticism, not cynicism, love will win in the end. May that hope, which is a central tenet of liberal theology, sustain us as we go about our work. May it be so. Amen.